Academy, episode 37. And, and personally, I feel that the automotive industry would prosper if everybody would stop quoting prices over the phone and stop quoting an hourly rate and go back to let's inspect the vehicle and base it on the needs of the vehicle as opposed to this mythical hourly rate. You know, most of my shops, I advocate five different labor rates at a minimum of five different labor rates. And we use those as the basis of writing the estimate. Welcome, automotive aftermarketers, to a Remarkable Results Radio Town Hall Academy. Listen to learn just one thing from today's episode on your journey to remarkable results. Welcome, automotive aftermarket professionals, to the Town Hall Academy, episode 37. Enjoy this important discussion on multiple labor rates and matrix parts margins as features in your shop management system. As you listen to the discussion, understand that these are opinions and not rules for setting labor rates or parts margins. Hey, welcome everyone. Carm Capriato here, thanking Jasper Engines and Transmissions for their support of the Town Hall Academy. Jasper has over 2,000 associates, three manufacturing facilities, two distribution centers, and 45 branch offices across the country. They're all working to produce, transport, and deliver the perfect product. That's what they do best. Keep customers happy. Hey, today's podcast has a sister video. If you want to see the discussion in action, you can find it at remarkableresults.biz slash A037. And there you can view the Academy as it unfolded. You'll also find extended bios on my guests and links to their previous episodes. Also on the show notes page, find an important part of the Academy, a compilation of the key talking points. Just copy, then paste, and create your own to-do list or even a meeting agenda. As a loyal listener of the podcast, are you using the special listening app? It's on your app store. Just search for Remarkable Results Radio, download, and have all the episodes, including every new episode release, delivered right to your smart device. Another quick way to get the app is to go to remarkableresults.biz slash app. We've got all kinds of shortcuts for you. Here's another shortcut for you, the tag cloud. You'll find that on the home and episodes page. There you can drill into the content and find specific episodes that deal with a subject you may have a special interest in. Here's the shortcut, remarkableresults.biz slash tag. Joining me in this needed discussion is John Francis from Francis Automotive, West Chester, PA, and a part-time business development coach for Elite Worldwide. Also, Bill DeBoyer from DeBoyer's Auto Sales and Service in Hamburg, New Jersey, and Mayla Newton from Educational Seminars Institute. As promised, I've included in the show notes page a link to the GoFundMe page for shop owners who've lost their business because of the devastating fires in California, and that was in October 2017. Now, enjoy another Town Hall Academy Education Forum. Well, listen, let's jump in this thing. Multiple labor rates. You know, one of the things that I had, you know, shop owners tell me, Malin, is that there's this way that you could use multiple labor rates to stay competitive. Do you, do you, you hear you guys telling you that? Well, it's something that we teach. I'm a firm believer in multiple labor rates because it allows the less technical jobs to be at a more competitive rate. For example, a basic brake job is less technically taxing as a drivability diagnosis. By having different labor rates for them, you can be a little more competitive with the brake jobs or the service work as opposed to charging everybody the high-end, high-tech OBD2 diagnostic times. And labor rates, Bill. Do you do that? You've got you have different labor rates depending on job. Yeah, well, we we definitely have different labor rates based on jobs, either in oil change or or diag. Uh, how we kind of build it? Our SMS allows us to have like four or five different categories, uh, but the way we we kind of build it out as different menu items inside uh, the job, the canned jobs itself. So that's where we kind of control the labor rate there versus the blanket. Got it. Does it depend on the state? Do you have to post those different labor rates or just one? New Jersey doesn't require you to post any labor rates at all. So, How about PA, John? You got to post a labor rate? No, we don't. Not at all. I'm in New York and they have to post a labor rate. And, and I'm not sure what goes on uh, with, with other shop owners that have multiple labor rates. Would a labor rate also include fleet? Absolutely. I yeah. mean, 
if you're going to do fleet work and you're going to lower your price, which I'm not an advocate of, um, you should have a fleet rate. The way we use our uh, SMS, we control the discount at the uh, the customer level versus having just a fleet rate in our system. That's how we use it. Bill, just tell me, what, what's your SMS? Whose do you use? We use WinWorks currently. WinWorks. And John, what do you use in your shop? Uh, Mitchell. John, you've got to really know what your effective labor rate is, right? Well, yeah, that's that's my biggest uh, uh, focus in, in my shop and shops that I work with and shops that I just talk with is, you know, uh, 15 years ago, nobody even knew what effective labor rate was. And uh, that that's a big number. And uh, one of the first things that happens if I get a new client or, you know, working with a friend or something and uh, – What's the effective labor rate? Because people always, most times, nobody wants to raise their labor rate. You know, that's the, I don't want to raise my rate. You know, they're afraid to do that. Uh, but knowing what your true effective labor rate is, is huge. Because a guy could have a posted door rate of 95 and his effective labor rate is 65. And for every hour that the techs are work billing, they're getting $65 and the owner thinks he's getting 90. John mentioned shops he works with. John is a part-time business coach for Elite, business development coach for Elite. And uh, so when, when you hear John talk about other shops, that's what he means. What are some ways, John, to start multiple labor rates? Well, some of the ways, I mean, when customers call at, at my shop and for years and years, you know, you get the calls, how much per hour do you charge? And uh, really the honest answer is, uh, if you called our shop today, I'd say it's anywhere from $14 an hour to $129 an hour, depending on whether we're changing your oil, inspecting your car, doing a water pump, or doing diagnostic work. And that's an honest answer. I mean, and, and that's the way you have to go to business today, I feel. Bill, I want to ask you, labor rates um, inside, does your SMS promote that? They don't really promote it. I mean, we control it. Where we really focus is uh, they got a nice profit indicator on each repair order. You got a red, yellow, and green light to monitor the, the profitability of the ticket. So that's kind of like our biggest check mark as we're building out estimates and repair orders. Okay, so you really start with a blank screen, right? A blank slate. A blank slate. What are you using? What are your matrix uh, labor rates? What, what What are your segments, actually? So, I mean... We have canned jobs that are like, take an oil change, for example. Like we'll go in and we'll add the parts, the oil, the filter, and then we'll, uh, there's a button that you hit for menu pricing. So we put in our menu price and then it forces the labor and the parts to balance out so that it comes to the price that we're desiring. Retail, wholesale, commercial, special warranty. Explain them to me. Yeah. So if you had, uh, you know, your, your fleet accounts, your retail accounts, you can go in if you wanted to and discriminate the labor prices for each of those categories. So if you had a fleet person that you're given, you know, a, a 10% labor discount on, you can set it up that way. So, uh, you know, when you built the ticket, it would be charged appropriately. The way we handle it is there's another way that you can do it and you can assign discounts at the customer level. So, you know, enterprise will get a different discount than another fleet provider that we have. A vehicle is more than just transportation. It's what we depend on to move our most precious cargo, our families. As a service professional, you provide routine maintenance for your customer's vehicle, but what do you do if the engine, transmission, or differential fails? Contact Jasper, of course. Jasper provides your customers with a cost-effective alternative to purchasing a different vehicle. Quality, remanufactured products from Jasper Engines and Transmissions carry a nationwide warranty with up to three years, 100,000 miles, parts and labor coverage. Get your customers back on the road fast as Jasper offers immediate availability through two distribution centers and a network of 45 branch locations nationwide. If a new vehicle is not in your customer's budget and the engine or transmission in their car, truck, van, or SUV has given its last performance, a remanufactured drivetrain component from Jasper Engines and Transmissions will provide them with many years of trouble-free driving at a cost many times less than that of a new vehicle. For customer satisfaction, choose Jasper. So big question, guys. Here I have a fleet customer coming in, and we're going to have to do some pretty heavy diagnostics on this F-150. Are they going to get um, a different labor rate because it's diagnostics, even though they're fleet and they may have a different rate? 
Yeah, so that's that's why we kind of control everything. Like we don't let that SMS control that part. So we build it on the ticket level. So if they're getting charged Diag, they're getting charged Diag, and then the discount will be whatever's negotiated into it. Okay, so each fleet would 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 have earned a so special. There's a number of different ways to Got skin it. the cat. I mean, the bottom line is you can control the pricing at different areas inside our system. Malin, you're out at many shops. You're talking to so many service professionals every week. What do you hear they're struggling with in 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 helping an SMS improve their profitability? Well, there's a couple things. First of all, that computer system needs to be set up properly with actual cost of doing business in it. Uh, biggest failure I see in a lot of people is they've never updated their labor cost or they don't input the current cost of the parts in. So the the profit indicator is way off base. So that's the first thing is set it up properly. The old adage of garbage in, garbage out. And I've seen computer systems that are probably five years outdated in cost of labor and such. But by using it and using consistently with the ability of multiple labor rates and then the pricing matrix on parts, it builds consistency in your estimates. So you're going to make more money on every ticket because you're doing it the same way every time. The... um, One of our biggest problems I feel in the automotive industry is we hinge too much on that hourly rate. Um, You know, in a lot of cases, when you get right down to it, we're not charging by the hour because we're using the flat rate book. And in some states, if you charge flat rate time and you tell people you're charging by the book and you do it in less and you don't adjust your pricing accordingly, you've actually committed fraud. So, you know, my answer to how much is my hourly rate is I don't have one. I charge by the job based on the inspection of my staff, not the flat rate book and not by a posted hourly rate. In my opinion, the posted hourly rate is an accounting number. That's all it's used for. So we evaluate every car. And, you know, most of my shops, I advocate five different labor rates at a minimum of five different labor rates. And we use those as the basis of writing the estimate. You know, I just had this thought about the uh, the companies out there like RepairPal, uh, good company, I know the people there, and, you know, they, they uh, bring business in, uh, but it, these customers still want to know the price of the job. You find that that's a challenge for a lot of shop owners? I, I think it is because... You know, in California, the labor rate varies from $120, $130 to $180, $190 an hour. And people don't understand that the cost of doing business affects that hourly rate, or it should because you set your hourly rate based on your cost of doing business. So when we price things by price only, by hourly rate, we're not really valuing ourselves. I mean, in reality, have you ever asked your cardiologist what he charges per hour? Hmm. We don't ask that question because it's never been that way. They price it based on the labor code, if you will, the, the medical operation number or the procedure number. And, and personally, I feel that the automotive industry would prosper if everybody would stop quoting prices over the phone and stop quoting an hourly rate and go back to let's inspect the vehicle and base it on the needs of the vehicle as opposed to this mythical hourly rate. Let's find out what's really wrong. Yeah, you can have your menu pricing up for oil changes and uh, and the like, but inspections, uh, you know, state inspections. But, y- you know, uh, y- you're right. And I continue to hear that over and over and over again. You had mentioned liability. Uh, what did you mean by that? Fraud? Well, we don't really charge by the hour. So for example, if you brought your car into me, Carmen, the book time for me to change that alternator was an hour. And I have a really sharp guy with the proper equipment and he gets it done in a half an hour. What do we charge the customer? We're going to charge him book time. But in reality, we worked on the car half an hour. So we're not charging by the hour. We're, we're charging by a mythical guide. So what I teach my clients to do is we evaluate every car because if your car comes in and it's got 100,000 miles on it, and you've never touched it and it's covered in oil, it's going to take longer to repair that car than a car that came in that's been serviced every three or 4,000 miles and is pristine. So we punish the customer who takes care of their car with higher labor times, and we actually give the guy with a car he hasn't taken care of a break because we're not charging what the value of the car is. Or you put aftermarket wheels and tires on it, or you raised it, or you lowered it. 
The time book doesn't take any of that. The flat rate book is a fallacy as far as I'm concerned. And we need to evaluate the cars on the actual needs and the condition of the car and use that, that book as a guide. Bill, John, uh, can you comment on that, uh, the, the, the flat rate book? Flat rate book uh, is, is just a guide, like Malin said. And uh, we use, at our shop and, and with my guys, we use a labor matrix because, uh, you know, you have clients that work in different areas, like up, upstate Michigan. There's like tons of rust. I mean, brake lines, frames, just mountain tires. It takes another half hour to clean the rust. So, you know, you have to add that cushion in there because you have to add in for the additional things that are going to happen on a normal basis. So that's why if, a, if a, say, a water pump, not water pump's not a good thing, but say a wheel bearing is, is 1.5 and we've got 15% and added on the labor matrix, we're going to get 15% more dollars to do that job. That's going to help the effective labor rate. And that's also going to help bring up the profitability in the shop. Okay. I love what you just said. How many guys are using those features? Those that, that the power of the SMS to do that. Well, my guys are. <laughs> okay. Your guys are. Malin, do you, do you see that? I think that people that use their SMS to even a third of its capability is a pretty small percentage. Yeah. Um, they don't understand it well enough to know its capabilities. They're too busy fixing cars to understand the power of that SMS system. I, I think that's part of our problem is we got to stop fixing cars and become business owners and understand the power of that computer that we paid a lot of money for and use it to its advantage to help us become profitable. I talked to some guys that come back from seminars that, you know, Mayla and John, you would teach, you know, that Bob would teach. And they, they come home and they say, oh, my God, I've I've been reborn. And they go out and they bump their labor rates up. Never do I hear some guy come back from a meeting and says, I'm going to spend the next three days on my SMS and I'm going to get inside of it. I'm going to call them. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to do online training. And I'm also going to find margin and opportunities inside of this piece of software that I let run my business. You know, Carmen, it's very interesting as this is an example I use in class. So you take an average shop owner, if he build a 10th of an hour more per technician per day, what would it mean at the end of the year? It would be huge money. And what's it take to get a 10th of an hour? It's using your SMS, right? It's estimating properly. It's even just marking the book time up 15 or 20%. So, Bill, you, you just told us earlier that you have WinWorks. Do you know it in and out? I know it fairly well. I've been using it for 20 years now. So, Got it. And you've committed to really learn it and make it a part of your business. Yeah, definitely. Getting back to, you know, we use, we kind of build everything on and we quote everything on the, uh, the job itself. So we're not counting on any labor matrix. You know, if a car comes in that's heavily rusted, obviously we're going to pad the labor time on that. And, um, you know, when we, we quote stuff, we're quoting the total job, what it takes. So we're not quoting hourly time. Like it's going to take an hour or my guy can get it done in a half hour, you know? So when we quote customers, everything's on the up and up and, you know, they know the full dollar amount for the job and it's not broken down so that they can get it itemized either by time or some other factor. Hey guys, let's jump into parts matrixes inside the SMS. John, let me ask you, um, is it easy to set up? Yes, very easy. Uh, I use a, an article that was in Ratchet and Wrench in 2014, and, and Bill Haas uh, wrote the article. And it really is a good article with a new client uh, to... Uh, show them how a parts matrix works. And sometimes, you know, you open up Pandora's box when you show somebody that screen and they have no idea what you're looking at. So you have to start at a certain place and make minor movements because sometimes shops can be completely upside down on your parts profit. I mean, you know, big time. So you have to move things slowly because here again, people are afraid, you know, if I'm overpriced, you know, they're going to, my customers will leave. It's it's so interesting, John, that you just said that the screen looks like Greek to them. Right. Where where 
<laughs> no disrespect intended. Where have they been? Well, yeah, and and you know, one of the things I find karma is is the the products are good. Like Mitchell's got a good system. Uh, Bold on makes it palatable, you know, but the reps in the different areas are either good guys and know the systems or don't know the first thing about the system. The rep done. All right. So, so uh, we want to get back to this matrix thing, but sometimes right. I'm going to chase this sil- silver bubble that just went across my screen here. <laughs> um, where is the training? Uh, J- John, you've had uh, Mitchell for a long time. Do they come up with enough upgrades that you would go out and say, hey, we, oh, I love this new feature. Train us on it. Well, they, I don't think I don't. That, that's one part, in my opinion, that they don't do a good job with letting us know about new updates. A lot of times they'll put them on Facebook and they'll do updates and, and they don't push them through to every client. So uh, I'll find something new on my system, like a new scheduling uh, program. And I find a client, we've had it, the program for a year, the new scheduler, and he doesn't have it yet. So, uh, you know, I've talked to them that that's just a weak point. And uh, I'm lucky enough to have a really, really good, Mitchell rep. Okay, so you got and and you're in, you're inside, if you will. You're you're connected. A gr- a great rep helping you with this stuff. Bill, is yours cloud based? No, ours is. Uh, we got a server, computer, and then uh, some network stations. That. That's what I was thinking about. If it was cloud based, everyone would have the latest versions. It would be easy to have everyone be on the same page. But do you have a choice, Bill, to upgrade or not? If there's a new feature. Yeah, yeah, they have annual updates. Uh, you, you can kind of mail in a payment and get an update. Uh, we've, we've recently we've been looking around, and you talk about the parts matrix. Uh, I sat in on a seminar that Shopware put on, and they just uh, rolled out a new feature for, um, or they built an algorithm. So there's no parts matrix per se. You set what your markups are and what your desired profitability is, and through the day or through the week, it just goes through and adjust the parts based on cost to the desired gross profit you're looking for. So kind of a whole different take on, you know, the, the matrix. Interesting. Um, is that Carolyn? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've had Carolyn on the phone before. Maybe she needs to come and share that algorithm. In fact, we hear about that all the time. Oh, the dreaded Facebook algorithm <laughs> and stuff. But you're right. There's a lot of intelligence built into code today that, that really helps with that. Currently with WinWorks, we have, uh, you know, three or four different matrices built in there based on where we're sourcing the parts. Would you mind sharing with us uh, what they are? Well, the dealership, obviously, that has its own matrix. Uh, You know, the stuff we could buy at the parts house has its own. And then the the job or warehouse has its own parts matrix as well. And a default parts house... Why would that have a different matrix than if you purchased from a WD or Jobber? I don't understand. T- tell me the difference between them. Well, so we're a Valvoline Express Care Center as well, so we get a, a better buy on the filters. So, oh. um, you know, we're obviously going to capitalize on that and give a bigger markup for those items. Got it. So, you know, we hear every once in a while, guys say, well, I, I, when I go to the dealer and I pay a little bit more, and frankly, I hear they're becoming extremely competitive on their on dealer parts. But are people mailing that you see your your clients in the in the in the service professionals you speak to each and every week? Are they saying, "Hey, listen, uh, I've got to make my normal margin on the dealer part. It just doesn't matter. The price is the price." Well, that should be the way it is because we have to. We talk about liability. We got to warranty that part. And they're not going to pay over-the-counter pricing if they go to the dealership and have the part replaced. And, and our biggest fear in the automotive industry is somebody questioning price. We're not proud enough of what we do to be able to justify it. Um, you know, everything we have to make money on. And the huge liability we have when we put a part on and something terrible happens, I mean, worst case scenario, it's going to be our butt in the sling, not the parts manufacturer in the beginning, eventually it'll get to that, the deep pockets. Um, you know, we have a pricing matrix, the one that was spoken about that Bill goes out. Uh, we've been using it for 30 years and that's a markup multiplier. This is what the cost is. This is what I mark it up to get what I need it to be. Uh, um, 
And most people are so frightened of price that they're afraid to actually charge what they need to. That's where we kind of go back to the become a business person. Um, you know, if you saw the markup that the florist makes or the jewelry guy makes or even the hamburger joint down the street, you'd be surprised. I mean, I know what my accountant, his hourly rate is. I don't care. He has a less than 1% audit rate. That's what I care about. I'm willing to pay for that. And most people are willing to pay for service. They're not buying a product anymore, especially in car repair. They're, they're buying an experience. And the better job we do of selling the experience, the less price enters into it. And, you know, people who are listening to your podcast are already probably the most expensive in their area. And they're busy. So it's not price. Here's the story. And, and, and every single week, this, this, this happens and this goes on, that more and more people um, join in the experience of listening to the podcast, going to the site, downloading the listening app, and are learning from all of this. And so I don't want to say we're only talking to that top 15%. Because the beauty of the podcast, it's out there, it's evergreen, it's going to be on demand. And in a year from now, maybe a struggling shop owner says, ooh, let's go listen to this thing on matrix, you know, labor and matrix margins on parts and learn a ton of things because um, they're, they're attempting to go at it on their own without any help. And I guess the, the way our industry grows is that we continue to talk about these things that we talk about each and every week prompts me to ask another question about margin on parts bill without sharing your deepest darkest secrets <laughs> and john uh, when you play with your matrix and i don't mean that in a negative way because you you know you you got these things going on and your your margin on a three dollar item may be you know different than the margin on a 200 hundred dollar cost part what are your average parts margins, guys? How's it all flow down? Range okay. on the parts markup. As a margin, business say. coach, John, is that a good number? That that's uh, Mill, and I don't know what, what what he'll say, but I would say that's it's right on the edge of being expensive. Uh, we try to hit somewhere between fifty and fifty-five, and and parts are parts. And I think that's going to change as we get more competition, that we're going to be forced to accept lower gross profits on our parts just because of the business model that's changing. And then we're going to have to make more money on labor because that's our biggest profit center anyway. Uh, but let me, we, we try to focus 50 to 55% is where we shoot for. We use a matrix that is broken down into dollars. Like if a part is a penny to a dollar, it gets a certain markup and it goes that way. Uh, and then you just have to watch when you get higher in price of cost. And I have two diesel shops I work with, and this really comes into play there. Or if you're doing a Jasper engine or transmission, it comes into play there. So you don't only have the parts gross profit, but you pay your bills with your parts gross profit dollars. So you could have a week of doing 35% gross profit, but you made $9,000 gross profit dollars. And you could have a week that you made 50% gross profit on your parts, but made $4,500 gross profit on your parts because of your volume. And truck shops tend to use more parts. Trucks eat parts. And uh, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, that's they tend to be a little bit lower in the in the high 40s. And that's acceptable because of the volume that we do with dollars. Yeah. The, yeah b big, big ticket, big ticket items on uh, on fleet and diesel. Malin, uh, I'm going to ask you when you would take a look at a company that maybe you'd be looking to have as a, a, a the coach. What are the margins you're seeing on parts? I think we need to focus on total ticket. Because it's correct. We may not be able to make the margin on parts, then we got to make it on the labor. So, you know, what we're looking for, total ticket as an average is 66% gross profit. So basically keep 66 cents out of every dollar we sell to pay our bills. And, you know, I, I like to see gross profit in the, in the 55 to 60% range on parts and around 70% on labor. But that is changing because not just competition, but the wages we have to pay. The bottom line is 
we got to start with setting your hourly rate based on your cost of doing business. You got to know what your effective labor rate is because I'm charging $100 an hour. My need is $80 an hour, but I'm only charging 50. I'm still losing money. And it goes back to understanding your numbers. Forget about what everybody else is doing. What are your numbers? And are you, are you paying your bills? Are you paying yourself? Then you got to work on, you know, again, a 1% increase in gross profit on labor and parts for a year can be tens of thousands of dollars. And that you can do through properly setting up your SMS system, having multiple labor rates, charging a little more for the difficult jobs, marking up the smaller, easier to mark up parts a little more than the more difficult, higher tech parts. It's, it's just a process. If you don't understand the numbers, the score of the game, and your SMS is a huge partner in that, you're going to be like many shops where you're not making enough money to cover your expenses or pay the owner. You just mentioned effective labor rate. And John, right at the beginning, you talked about that. Wow. Uh, Bill, do you know your effective labor rate? Yeah, we uh, we go through every Monday and we compile the previous week's numbers. And that's one of the KPIs that we track weekly. All right. So good. Everybody's on the same page for that. But yet as business coaches, John, you brought it up as one of the most important parts. Is that when you when you start working with a client, is that one of the first things you, you talk about? Because I guess if you don't know that the margin of the whole shop, be it labor or parts, would have to be massaged. Well, yeah, and it has a huge effect on the total gross profit. I mean, if your uh, parts gross profit, just use an example, and I don't have any clients with this number, but say if it was in the 40s, that shop wouldn't be open long. It couldn't survive. Uh, we like to see guys in the 70%, and I have some guys that are higher, uh, and multiple labor rates. Uh, really, really help that. And I just want to share something with Ford is, uh, is uh, putting out more support for their Power Stroke Pride shops. And uh, they're starting to make sales calls like AC Delco does and like Napa does. And one of my guys in New Hampshire, uh, excuse me, Massachusetts, uh, they were sharing uh, labor, uh, multiple labor rates with the outside repair shop, meaning this, the shop that I coach and, uh, they were asking how much he charges and they're instituting. And, and I also created it for, for my truck shops, uh, labor rate based on the GVW of what we're working on. And, uh, when you're working on a in chassis engine overhaul on a Peterbilt, there's no way that could be the same labor rate. If you're doing brakes and calipers on an F-350, it, you know, it just can't be. Uh, so Ford, I think I might've mentioned it is Carm Ford realizes that a lot, like over 80% of the people that buy Ford diesels today are having them fixed in independent repair shops. So they're trying to get out and snuggle up to us to make sure we buy good parts for their trucks. So they continue with a good reputation. So they want the shops to be successful. So they're, you know, helping out with tips where they can. Good stuff, guys. Yeah, re really good stuff. I appreciate this. Uh, you know, all, the academies always seem to go in, in some real great places. And, you know, we, we, we end up, uh, uh, you know, hitting a couple of home runs during this. So I, I appreciate so many of the, the great points that came out. Uh, gross profit dollars. You know, it was, it was a lesson I learned many, many years ago uh, that, you know, we don't pay our bills with gross profit percent. We pay it with dollars. Is that the magical, is that one of the, the magical, once someone, shop owner gets that is, that, is that a magical breakthrough? I think it's a starting point. There's, there's a lot of things that are magical in the automotive repair business. Uh, gross profit dollars, absolutely. Productivity, which affects that effective labor rate, in my opinion, is most people are missing the mark. But to go back to something I've said many times, Carm, is these guys invest tons of money to learn new things and they need to go back and implement. Um, whether it's learning the SMS system better, whether it's paying attention to effective labor rate, whether it is working on productivity, you know, charging more for older vehicles per hour than maybe 
some of the newer vehicles because they're harder to work on. You know, in the, in the East Coast, you got rust. Uh, you know, we're pretty fortunate. We get a rusted car. We don't know what to do with it out here. But we get guys that go four-wheel driving through the mud. They should pay more. I mean, there's there, every, every regional area has to look at what their pain points are and charge accordingly because we can't have this one size fits all pricing anymore. It's just too difficult to do this. So, you know, the way I look at it is I got my most expensive technician using the most expensive tools who took the most expensive training. He should not be working for the same hourly rate as the guy who's changing the oil. Not that that's not an important job, but I'm spending tens of thousands on, on my diagnostic technician. I need to make sure I recruit that money somehow. Is teaching a new client uh, the matrix hard or easy? It's not hard to teach them it. It's hard for them to, to get over the idea they're going to have to charge more money. It's, they still think people are coming to them because of price. So that's, that's the hurdle, I think, is getting them out of the idea that if they raise their hourly rate, 2 or $3 an hour, and they charge one or two percentage more points on parts, nobody's going to leave them. And I've had shops have to raise their hourly rate 20 or $30 to, to be just where they need to be. Forget the effective rate. That's just the projected rate. And they raise it 3 or $4 or $5 a month. And pretty soon they're like, nobody questions it. Nobody says anything. So let's go up the rest. Fed guys go up 20 or $30 in one day and nobody questions it because they're not coming because of price. But our biggest problem is we don't see the value in what we do, in my opinion. Uh, we, we need to understand what we do is difficult. It's complex. Not many people do it and do it well, and we need to get paid better for it. Someone brought up, uh, John, it was you. You said, hey, look at guys, um, we're going to have to really rethink the margin on parts. Uh, obviously, the, the, you could walk out of a shop, go online with your smartphone and find out a price on a part from a million places. And here's 80 bucks on your invoice and you could buy it for 29. Are you saying that that may be a reason to rethink it? Well, I'm saying that that is going to start to be more of a pushback uh, for customers. And in some areas, it is a pushback. Uh, if you've got a, a smaller town and O'Reilly's, I guess it's okay to say O'Reilly's, but O'Reilly's is the main parts place. So this particular shop, gets price shopped all the time with their Rileys. And, but it's, you have to talk to the customer in a way that I'm warranting the part. I have a much better warranty than O'Reilly. Some, some of my guys are two years, some are three years. Uh, we're three years. Uh, and the added benefits and features that you get by us doing the job. So you have to add the value. It's not just the part. It's, it's us putting it on and standing behind it. I understand. But, uh, John, do you think that a, we're going to see um, a different a shift between parts margins and labor margins with this uh, transparency of, of pricing? Uh, I don't. Parts is, is not. I'm not sure what's going to happen to parts. You've got people like Amazon getting involved in it. I can buy Amazon parts, uh, not Amazon parts, but I can buy the same parts from Amazon cheaper uh, than my jobber. Same part. That's a problem, okay? So, but labor, I don't see. I, I see that that labor needs to go up big time. And I'm, you know, like Malin said, twenty, thirty dollars. I think most shops never seen a shop go out of business because he was too high priced. But lots of them go out of business because they're too low. And I think uh, Cecil said that in his podcast. And I think labor is going to be, it, it's going to be a profit center. I mean, it's 70% of what we're trying to get for a total profit is, is labor. So if we have to, you know, uh, squeeze a little more out of labor, that shouldn't be a problem. It's all in how you present it to the customer. And, and you've got to have confidence that you're worth it. That's, that's, that's a huge problem. You're right. You're right. Uh, Bill, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot again. I, I've re you've done so well. Every time I've asked a really tough personal question, <laughs> thank you for this. Uh, do you, uh, would you ever see yourself moving to a much higher labor rate and saying to the customer, listen, here's what it cost me 29 bucks for the part, 10% over? Yeah. I totally can. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to see how far down the road this stuff's going to play out. But, you know, 
with Alexa voice and stuff being integrated into cars. I mean, when the, the person calls and tells their car to schedule an appointment at DeBoer's Auto and the car shows up with the parts delivered by Amazon and we just have to install them. I mean, at the end of the day, we have a cost of doing business. We have to make X amount of dollars to stay in business, pay our people and continue our training and all that stuff. And you know, whether you get it out of parts or you get it out of labor, there's going to be some sort of, you know, you're going to make what you're going to make to stay alive. Do you see that you say, listen, you don't have to buy this stuff from Amazon. I'm just going to charge you 10% over. And if you want the warranty and you want my part, you want uh, you, know, you want me to ensure this this repair, you've got to use the parts. I, I, I don't care what you, I don't care if they bought the brand name from Amazon, you have to have a channel to go back if there is a problem. <laughs> if the part goes bad, you're going to give it back to the customer and he's got to go do the warranty claim? I mean, the, yeah, no, the, the, I there, mean there's, a, there's a problem there. Yeah. For right now, the way we're doing business, I mean, we just install our own supply parts and I don't really see customer supplied stuff. You know, it, our policy at our shop is if it's customer supplied, it's double the labor rate and no warranty. And it's been that way for many years and usually just, you know, it takes care of the problem. The customer either agrees with it or they move on. So. Well, I know we've kind of offshooted this this topic a little bit, but uh, it's good and it's healthy because that's what we do on the show. We we <laughs> we we talk about stuff. <laughs> hey, Carm. Here's my biggest concern <laughs> coming from a state with more attorneys than people <laughs> is if you if you think about this. So the customer buys an alternator from from X Y Z online and brings it to you, and you install it. And down the road, that alternator catches fire and burns the guy's car to the ground. Worst case scenario, right? You might have to prove in court it wasn't your installation that caused the alternator to fail. Now, that's going to require time, effort, and that's a very difficult thing to do. So a lot of what's happening out here is the insurance companies aren't going to cover you if you install a customer furnished part. Because their liability skyrockets because now they're going to have to prove your installation wasn't the problem. So, you know, I think part of our problem in, in what we do is it goes back to value of what we do. Um, you know, I, I told a class the other day, I said, look, I, I went on to uh, Google and I learned how to do an appendix removal and I got a pocket knife here who will let me take their appendix out. And I said, I'm pretty sure I can do it because I read it and I watched a YouTube video on it. But nobody would climb up on the table. So it goes back to we have to have confidence in what we do and we have to sell the value of what we do. As was spoken, the warranties, the service, longevity of business, all of those things. And we got to focus more on building value and being, you know, the, 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 the car guys than we are about being parts exchangers. And I think that's where we need to focus a lot of our effort into is becoming that car guy, you know, the, the person they trust that's going to fix their car. You think about this, Carm. Most people want you to take care of their car because they trust you, not because of what you charge. We're going to get back to that, that you know, the concierge service mentality that you've talked about before. Um, and I don't care whether you bring me the parts or not. I have to make the same amount of money because my overhead didn't change. So if I can't make it on parts profit, I got to make it on labor. And uh, one of the gentlemen said, you know, you bring me your parts, it's two times. A good friend of mine, in fact, the founder of the company I now own said, you know, friends and family, it's double or nothing because the liability stays the same. And that's really what parts results in. We have liability and we need to make sure we make X amount of money to accept the risk. That's my take on that. Well, hold your thoughts, Bill and John, because I'm going to let that be Malin's last word. Beautiful ending. Gave us a lot to think about, Malin. I'm going to give you the last word, John. But, Bill, any final thoughts about our wonderful topic here or anything that we've talked about? No, I just completely agree with Malin. I mean, we have the knowledge gap, and that's what we have to get paid for. So, I mean, we need to become better skilled, oriented at being able to communicate that to the customer. So, I mean... I believe everybody in this industry is way underpaid for what they do. I mean, I was just talking to a shop owner the other day and we're talking about pricing and such. And, you know, he's a veteran. He's been in the industry for probably 30 years. You know, he just had his one shoulder done this past uh, January. He's going in for his next shoulder and he's got a knee 
I mean, and he's just still undercharging. He's not getting the money that he's, he should be. So, I mean, whether you charge it on parts or you charge it on labor, you got to figure out what you need to make to make this all worth what you're doing. Why is it so hard, guys, uh, to not have a hobby anymore, to have a profession? I, 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 I keep hearing this over and over again. Why is it so hard? Because they love fixing cars. They didn't go into this business to be a business owner. They went in this business to fix cars. They love talking to cars. I, I yep. get it. John, I'm going to give you the last word. Wrap it up for us. <laughs> well, uh, I chime in with what Bill said and what Malin said. Uh, we've got to add value. You can you can really you know put the icing on the cake when you're selling the job by the added value that your shop offers. And, and don't forget. Don't forget this important part is if you bring in the technician, like in our shop, uh, we have Pat that works on Porsches and, you know, bringing in that added feature, say Pat's the best guy around on Porsches. He's working on your car today and, and, and you know, we made a good choice in fixing this car and, and Pat's the guy that's going to get us square to what, or it be Bill or Harry. And then you bring the personal touch in but it's the adding the value, the stuff that the, the other guys can't do, the dealerships can't do, the, the guy on the corner can't do. We're the pros, and we have to have confidence that we are the pros, and the more confidence that we have in ourselves, the better off we'll do for our companies. I love it. Thank you so much. And it, bra- it prompts me to promote an episode that we did probably two and a half to three months ago on concierge service. In fact, you mentioned it, Malin. What an incredible episode. I mean, this thing c- keeps getting listens each and every day. It is such a great episode. And it really talks about taking, you know, this whole value stream to the to the new and next level. So all I encourage everyone to do is go to the RemarkableResults.biz website, find the search button, type in concierge. And it'll pop right up. And uh, and guess what? You're going to be uh, in for a great, great treat. Thank you guys so much for this great Town Hall Academy. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, you guys. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time.